Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Corey Blad. I'm the Dean of the School of Liberal Arts. And this afternoon, we celebrate the 21st annual Brother Casimir Gabriel Costello Lecture and the awarding of the 11th annual Costello Award for Excellence in Teaching. <laughs> yes, way to go indeed. The Brother Casimir Gabriel Costello FSC Award for Excellence in Teaching recognizes a faculty member of the School of Liberal Arts who exemplifi exemplifies the excellence in teaching that characterizes Manhattan College and, it's and is central to its mission and that of the Salian Christian Brothers. The award is named in memory of Brother Casimir Gabriel Costello, a Manhattan College graduate who chaired its Department of History for many years and served as the Dean of the College from 1953 to 1959. His book, The Arches of the Years, traces the history of Manhattan College from its founding until 1979. The award is made possible through the generosity of Patricia and Jack Stack, representing the Costello family, who have graciously supported this lecture series, as well as the Department of History for the past 11 years. Thank you. As mentioned, this is the 11th year of the Costello Award for Excellence in Teaching, and I have the distinct pleasure of introducing this year's recipient who epitomizes the whole person education that defines our LaSallean mission. The winner of the 2023 award is an accomplished member of the Department of Philosophy. A creative and courageous scholar of contemporary ethics, she is regularly engaging topics and questions at the crossroads of our lived experience. A nationally recognized e expert on the ethics of artificial intelligence, she has published widely on any number of applied issues, including the ethics of self-driving cars. And I think I speak for most of us when I say that I'm very happy that somebody extremely intelligent is on that. <clears throat> Her most recent book, Beyond the Code, a guidebook for the ethical engineer, was the winner of the 2022 Choice Award for Outstanding Academic Text by the National Library Association. This expertise permeates her courses and students regularly rave about the dynamic structure of their class experience. From teaching argumentation to applying those skills in collaborative assignment evaluation to course structure adjustments in response to student learning, these are just a few of the many cited examples of her innovative, innovative and empathetic approach. In the words of her students, she is very open, warm, and welcoming. She is very approachable and is understanding when confusion is present. We should all be so lucky. Her teaching style is not intimidating and inspired me to want to learn more about philosophy. She inspired me every day of class and was the most genuine professor I've possibly ever had. A fundamental contributor to the ethical heart of the School of Liberal Arts, please join me in congratulating the recipient of the 2023 Costello Award for Excellence in Teaching, Dr. Heidi Fury. <laughs> she really is outstanding. I would like to now present the Chair of History, Dr. Adam Aronson, who will introduce today's honored speaker, Dr. Sarah McDougall, the John Jay College of Criminal Justice and the CUNY Graduate Center. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Okay, actually, I, I will introduce uh, a little more about the lecture series, and then Dr. Edwards will introduce our speaker. So uh, welcome again to the 21st annual lecture in a uh, series honoring the memory of Brother Casimir Gabriel Costello. Although I also had no uh, opportunity to meet Brother Gabriel, who was known as Cas Gabe, the warm memories shared by his students, colleagues, and family have enriched my experience here at Manhattan College over the years. Brother Gabriel was born in 1910 in Jersey City, 
to Irish immigrants and raised in Manhattan and Brooklyn by his mother after the early loss of his father. He knew his vocation for the church and for history already during his school days at Holy Name. At 14, he left home to join the brothers, and five years later, he started teaching. Brother Gabriel's first assignments were at St. Columba's and LaSalle Academy in New York City, from where he traveled to Manhattan College to continue his education, to swim, and to play basketball. Before he was 30, he started a career teaching college at the Staten Island Division of Manhattan College, which existed before World War II, and studied for his PhD at Fordham. In 1949, a few months before his 40th birthday, he came to Manhattan College to serve as the head of the history department, where he taught modern European history. During his career here, he was dean of the college and a delegate to the 39th general chapter in Rome. He oversaw the division of the department into what's now two departments, history and political science. As dean of the college, Cascade stressed that the college must offer a liberal education to all of its students, no matter what their area of concentration. As he once wrote, the college exists primarily for the cultivation, cultivation of intellectual virtues, and these can never yield primacy to either the functional or the vocational. It was in this spirit that Brother Gabriel defended academic freedom, most notably during the dark days of the McCarthy era. Following the Second Vatican Council of 1962 to 65, much of his time and energy went into adapting its teachings to the life and organization of the brothers, both here on campus, in the province, and around the world. He respected tradition, but he also believed that it should provide a starting point for progress. In that vein, he supported uh, the Institute, which is now known as the Peace Studies Program here on campus as well. He built up the history department by hiring young and talented lay historians, including Fred Frederick Schweitzer, who's here with us today as an emeritus professor, who might, who might be able to continue and ensure the LaSallean pedagogical tradition at Manhattan College. It's no accident that this proud Christian brother, Brother Gabriel, dedicated his account to the college of the college's centennial to the lay faculty of 10 decades, whose Christian and scholarly attainments have brilliantly illuminated the pages of Manhattan's history. In every field of endeavor, until his death in 1992, Brother Gabriel represented the finest traditions of Manhattan College and of the Christian Brothers. This lecture series was launched with a generous donation from one of his many grateful students, Roger Goebel, who graduated from Manhattan College in 1957 with a degree in history and who became a professor of law at Fordham and the director of the Center for European Union Law before his death in 2018, after more than 30 years on the Fordham faculty. We are fortunate to have with us some of Brother Castillo's relatives and others who have known him, um, and we are honored to uh, continue to honor his memory with this lecture series. Thank you. So, my colleague, Dr. Jennifer Edwards, will now uh, introduce our speaker. While I am very, very happy to have passed the job on to Dr. Aronson, organizing the Costello Lecture was one of the highlights of serving as chair of the history department, especially the chance to pick our speaker. The mission from our generous donors, Patricia and Jack Stack, is to select a speaker who can engage students and our whole community, a speaker whose historical work resonates with our current moment. When I thought about this year's event, I knew immediately we had to invite the illustrious scholar here with us today. Dr. Sarah McDougall, the woman behind the paper, is professor of history at John Jay College of Criminal Justice with several appointments at CUNY Graduate Center. She earned her PhD in history at Yale. She is the author of two books, Bigamy and Christian Identity in Late Medieval Champagne and Royal Bastards, The Birth of Illegitimacy, 800 to 1230, as well as a number of articles on women, gender, sex, and the law. She has held several visiting appointments and fellowships, including at the University of Paris, Oxford University, and the Institute for Advanced Study. Dr. McDougall teaches courses that sound amazing. Um, they include female felons in the pre-modern world, bastards and thrones in medieval Europe, sex and single mothers in medieval France, and famous trials. Sign me up. She is a co-founder and editor of the Middle Ages for Educators site that was an essential resource for teachers through the pandemic. She is a tireless and enthusiastic supporter of students and colleagues, nurturing scholarly networks in multiple venues. Professor McDougall is also a prolific public historian who has written for Slate, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Ms. Magazine. 
She has a talent for communicating the significant medieval context from modern legal news and media to a public audience. In the series for Slate, she and David Perry examined the portrayal of a medieval assault case in the film The Last Duel, even excavating real medieval sources for hair choices, such as Matt Damon's mullet. Many of her public articles, I had to mention the mullet, um, many of her public articles are essential reading, such as her co-authored piece, Abortion Was a Crime, in the Docket Law and History Review on Medieval References in the Dobbs Ruling. Essential, it's going to be in all my classes. And her article on Ghislaine Maxwell and the long history of female traffickers, procurers, and abusers provides important context on the long history of women profiting from exploiting other women. Professor McDougall's talk today shines a spotlight on another significant contemporary legal case and its medieval parallels. Her title is E. E. Jean and Jean from Lorraine, Judging Sexual Assault, Medieval and Modern. And if it's not obvious from the title, a trigger warning that this will talk about sexual assault. Please join me in welcoming Professor McDougall. I knew this was at my limit. Perfect. So um, I, I'm so grateful for this invitation and I'm so honored to be here with you all. And I'm so um, uh, intimidated by my introduction that I don't know, I, I, I don't know what to say <laughs> except that um, thank you and, and I hope uh, I hope this does uh, some tribute. I, I did not have the opportunity to meet the man this talk is in honor of, uh, and so I don't know that much about him beyond uh, what I just heard and an obvious commitment to the humanities and to learning. Uh, one of my main goals today will be to highlight the role of one sustaining product of the humanities, of storytelling, narrative, as a tool for healing, for restoration, for seeking change. And so I hope that serves as a tribute to him. Uh, I will add that I mostly do not know you, which I hope to rectify soon. Please introduce yourselves to me, ask me questions, tell me anything that interests you, be in touch after this lecture if you wish. My email is there at the, at the bottom of this. Um, uh, so there we go. Uh, as the title suggests, this talk is inspired by two women who lived centuries apart, but who shared many things in common, not the least of which having to undergo the awful experience of seeking justice by alleging a sexual assault. I will begin uh, with a quote from the 2019 memoir of one of these two women, E. Jean Carroll. I did it. Uh, I quote, uh, my first rich boy pulled down my underpants. My last rich boy pulled down my tights. My first rich boy, I had fixed my eyes on his face long enough to know, was beautiful, with dark gray eyes and long golden brown hair across his forehead. I don't know what he grew up to be. My last rich boy was blonde. He grew up to be the president of the United States. So E. Jean Carroll's account of these two assaults uh, come as part of a longer list that she calls uh, the most hideous men of my life list. As she explains, to quote, it is a list of the 21 most revolting scoundrels I have ever met. I started it in October 2017, the day Jody Cantor and Megan Tui published their Harvey Weinstein bombshells in the New York Times. As the riotous, sickening stories of Me Too surged across the country, I, like many women, could not help but be reminded of certain men in my own life. When I began, I was not sure which among the foul harassers, molesters, traducers, swindlers, stranglers, and no-goods I've known were going to make the final accounting. After almost two years of drawing and redrawing my list, I've come to realize that, Though my hideosity bar is high, my criteria are a little cockeyed. It is a gut call. 
I just know a hideous man when I see one, and I have seen plenty. End of quotation. Uh, e. Jean Carroll, born and raised in Indiana, became a famous journalist and TV celebrity and a fixture of New York society and fashion. She spent much of her adult life in the public eye and spent her whole life, as she is the first to admit, as in this memoir, entangled with boys and men who all too often abused her. Throughout her life, until the publication of this memoir, she shared the adventures with the public, but not the abuse. The memoir, as with an excerpt printed in New York Magazine at the time of publication in 2019, intermingles memories of terrible experiences with humorous exchanges and escapades as E. Jean travels throughout the United States to meet with women and ask them to tell her what men are good for. In this memoir, E. Jean Carroll has much to criticize in men, but she does not shy away from the fact that while men routinely did awful things to her, she routinely sought men out. I quote, when I entered Indiana University, I was the most boy crazy 17 year old in the nation. End of quotation. As the memoir, her subsequent legal complaint and request for a trial by jury details, about 27 years ago, E. Jean Carroll was sexually assaulted in the dressing room of Bergdorf Goodman Luxury Department Store. Why didn't she come forward then with an accusation? A quote from the complaint, Carroll knew then that sexual assault was pervasive. She also knew that men had been assaulting women and getting away with it since before she was born. And she knew that while a woman who accused any man of rape was rarely believed, a woman who accused a rich, famous, violent man of rape would probably lose everything. End of quotation. Unfortunately, it is all too true that men have been assaulting women and getting away with it since before Carol was born. The idea that women who accused any man of rape was rarely believed, and that a woman who accused a rich, violent man of rape would probably lose everything, to, to quote from the complaint again, is all too true. The rate of sexual abuse of women in this country is horrifically high, perhaps even as high as one in five women. Very few of those women go to police or make accusations, probably because they, like Carol, think that going to court will only make things worse for them. It remains to be seen what, if anything, will change about how sexual assault prosecutions work as a result of E. Jean Carroll's series of glorious legal victories over the past few months, with win after win accorded to Carroll and the brilliant legal team led by the extraordinary Roberta Kaplan. As an aside, if you have any interest in learning about what good lawyers can do to seek social justice, I highly recommend learning about Roberta Kaplan and others like her, which you can do, for example, by looking to the work of lawyer-turned-journalist lawyer Dahlia Lithwick, among others. Uh, as a historian engaged in studying women's encounters with justice in the Middle Ages, I found myself wondering throughout Carol's ongoing trials, not just about what would or could change in the present, but how to understand the history of sexual assault and its medieval history in particular. While many of you were not yet alive when E. Jean Carroll was assaulted in Bergdorf Goodman's, you did live through, I think, the 2016 election and the Me Too movement. That very recent history got so many of us thinking about sexual assault and rape. Much of the thinking and calls for change came from people like you, the, the students, the younger generations. Certainly it was in the classroom that I found myself most often asked to talk about rape in the Middle Ages. Before I say anything more, I want to explain what business I think I have talking about E. Jean Carroll and also give you some sense of what I plan to present for you today. Essentially, I will make a plea for the appropriate use of the present in the study of the past. This kind of work requires constant alertness to what is called the strangeness of the past, the potential ways in which they in the past are not like us in the present. It also requires studying the past in careful context, attuned to its nuances and complexities. In summer of 2022, an academic squabble over something called presentism took place among historians and fellow travelers. There was a very timely response from Princeton history professor David Bell in the Chronicle of Higher Education, 
called Two Cheers for Presentism. I will be quoting from it extensively because it lays up very nicely what I think the problems and hopefully solutions are, and hopefully justifies my making a comparison in this presentation between a woman who is very much alive and kicking today and one who lived at the end of the Middle Ages. As Professor Bell explained in the summer of 2022, then president of the American Historical Association, Professor James Sweet, had suggested that, I quote, for too many contemporary scholars, the past only matters when read through the prism of contemporary social justice issues, race, gender, sexuality, nationalism, capitalism. For Bell, there are many reasons, though, to do just that. And now I'm quoting from Professor Bell. Reading the past through the prism of contemporary issues in this way does not mean unthinkingly imposing present day categories on it. Historians always have a responsibility to understand as precisely as possible the meanings that words, things, and actions had for people in the past, and to handle evidence scrupulously and not to cherry pick their sources. There are obligations of sound scholarship. In fact, Historians who insist they are looking at the past entirely on its own terms, as if they could shut out the present like flicking a light switch, are more, not less, likely to import their own unconscious, unconscious preconceptions into their work than those who consciously try to keep both present and past in view. Bell continued, I quote, For all these reasons, what Sweet called presentism is to be accepted and even applauded, not denounced, at least to a certain extent. But at the same time, we need to be aware of the ways that it can also impoverish our understanding and appreciation of history. The past, it has often been said, is a foreign country. Weird, wonderful, and strange. Great historians give a visceral sense of this foreignness, showing that what looks familiar at first sight is really anything but and revealing with an anthropologist's eye the many wildly different forms the human spirit and human societies can take. It is crucial to keep in mind what Sweet in his essay called the values and mores of people in their own times and how they differed from our own values and mores. In short, good historical scholarship requires maintaining a delicate balance between, on the one hand, trying to convey the sheer strangeness of the past and, on the other, revealing its connections to the present and to our own concerns. Making things yet more complicated, we also need to take into account the process by which collective memory and scholarship have themselves progressively shaped understanding of a subject, with new layers of meaning accreting with each generation. The challenge is even greater because we live in a society saturated in stories of the past that run roughshod over all these distinctions. Historians should ideally address all this and also keep alive a sense of the past's strangeness and wonder. And that's the end of the quote. Uh, so all of that, or at least some of that, is what I will try to do for you today. I'm just making it, <laughs> building a higher and higher bar for myself. Uh, as I began to explain earlier, uh, it is because of me too, I am sure, that I have been thinking more about consent and sexual assault in the last several years. And I think that my research has benefited rather than suffered as a result. Following the trials of E. Jean Carroll have helped me to better understand how to think about the sexual assault that is part of the book I am writing about Jean from Lorraine. More than that, I am starting to better understand the shifting nature of sexual assault and its handling in the courts of justice, as well as the courts of public opinion. In what follows, I will explain what I have learned from this exercise of thinking about the very modern E. Jean Carroll while writing about the medieval Jeanne from Lorraine, as well as its implications for us living in the world that Carroll and Kaplan have just set about seeking to change for the better. In particular, I want to address some of the key points from E. Jean Carroll's legal complaint, that men have been getting away with sexual assault since before she was born, that those people who make accusations are not believed, and that their lives are ruined if they dare to make an, ex an accusation. Uh, these all too often true features of our modern world are bound up with the idea of the, I quote, perfect victim in rape law. 
the idea that women who allege rape should, first of all, be female, women or girls, but second, have spotless reputations, have done nothing that could be construed as inviting the sexual attention of men and never having done anything that might make a man think that sex might be welcome. They also have to immediately come forward with evidence of the crime, evidence also that they had screamed and fought back. This very specific script, demanding impossible perfection as well as a very specific set of responses, sets an impossibly high bar. It's often assumed and easy to suppose that all of this was also true in the Middle Ages, but that is not quite right. That supposition is based on some misconceptions about what the medieval practices were, as well as various other aspects of medieval culture and society that require more nuanced thinking to grasp their complexities and really their strangeness. This misconception matters because it obscures what I think are the very real problems with rape and rape prosecution, both then and now. In the Middle Ages, believing the victim was not really at issue. It was all too believable that a woman was raped in the Middle Ages. The problem was what anyone was willing or able to do about it. As I will explain, and I hope you will ask for clarifications because there is much more to say, rape was illegal, at least in some forms. There were laws all over the books against abduction and forced sex, and doing either was frequently listed among the most grave of crimes, deserving the most grave of penalties. But rape was pervasive nonetheless. There was no concept of rape within marriage as a possible thing. Outside of it, the rigid systems of inequality and the extreme power of the powerful to act with impunity certainly included sexual assault, and the laws and legal practices gave survivors very little recourse. One thing that scholars studying rape have missed, though, and this is essential to understanding the strangeness of medieval rape, is that the ability of the powerful and the less powerful to rape with impunity functioned not as an exception, but part of a general rule in which might all too often may, might made right, not just for rape, but for all manner of crimes. To be sure, though, in some cases of rape, people, even low status and disreputable, disreputable women, could absolutely make rape accusations and even win their case but in circumstances that might make them regret doing so. The failure to create a workable system for survivors to seek and obtain justice is what most sadly remains all true today, even as the details and circumstances have changed from the Middle Ages. But in seeking a more positive note to end on, I will conclude with a brief reflection on the power of storytelling, of narrative, to heal, to educate, to seek change, or at least to try to understand... <laughs> and the possible role of the past and of historians in this storytelling. I will now describe some of the history that E. Jean Carroll and her lawyers were up against. Most of all, they had to confront some pernicious and very old ideas about assault and assault accusers. Those of you who followed the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trials in particular will not be surprised to learn that even after Me Too, imperfect accusers suffer a great deal when seeking justice. According to lawyer and activist Alexandra Brodsky, writing in her excellent book, Sexual Justice, I quote, Our collective fear of scorned, lying, irrational women who falsely cry rape has been ingrained in our culture and law for centuries, no matter how baseless the archetype. It's the end of a quote. Where does this idea come from? There's, a quite, there's quite a few very old traditions, biblical and otherwise, that I can discuss in more detail if there is interest. But Brodsky is quite right to point to one most obvious offender in a long tradition of what we call victim blaming, the English barrister, judge, and jurist, Sir Matthew Hale. As Brodsky writes, I quote, the 17th century English jurist, Sir Matthew Hale, did not invent this exceptionalism, but through his influential writings, he gave it form and force that shaped centuries of Anglo-American law for the worse. End of quotation. Uh, here it is from his The History of the Pleas of the Crown, Volume 1. I quote, Hale, It is true rape is a most detestable crime and therefore ought severely and impartially to be punished with death. But it must be remembered that it is an accusation easily to be made and hard to be proved. 
and harder to be defended by the party accused, though never so innocent. So that's Hill. These ideas made their way into our laws and our culture, and there they persist. They persist in the face of endless studies demonstrating that while the rate of sexual abuse of women in this country is horrifically high, very few of those women still ever make an accusation. And as for false accusations, those are obviously hard to know much about, but at best guess, the rates seem to be roughly the same as any kind of accusation. And yet, as Brodsky explains, those who accuse rape are still treated differently and long before they ever get to a courtroom. There is a disturbing lack of willingness to believe among men in general and among police officers in particular. E. Jean Carroll won despite all of this. It is well worth pausing over what she was up against, as well as what she and her brilliant legal team did. Um, not there, not in the Middle Ages yet, but I wanted a little change. Uh, so writing in the Atlantic Monthly, Megan Garber explained how defense attorney Joe Tecopina tried to make use of the legacy of Matthew Hale in the courtroom. I quote, defense attorney Joe Tecopina turned disdain into performance art. He invoked misleading tropes, the perfect victim, the woman who should know better, and built his case around Carol's lack of conformity to them. Why didn't she call the police? Why didn't she come forward publicly? Why didn't she scream? Questioning Carol, Tecopina sneered at her. He disrespected her. He made her cry. He tried to use her individuality against her. It didn't work. Carol, just as she claims to have done in that dressing room, fought back. At every step, she emphasized, politely, patiently, unwaveringly, the foolishness of Tacopina's line of questioning. The behavior at issue she and her team kept reminding the jury was not hers. We can also read more on this from Monica Hesse in the Washington Post. I quote, on the witness stand, Carol was brash, funny, self-effacing, and shrewd. She did not apologize for the way she had behaved during or after the alleged assault. She didn't even try to make much sense of it. Yes, it was true that she'd wondered whether revealing the assault in her 2019 memoir would help juice the book sales. I would like to sell the book I'm writing. Yes, she responded, as if talking to a four-year-old. But that didn't mean the assault hadn't happened. Another quote. In the most, diz in the most dizzying moment of the trial, Tecopina appeared to think he could cast Carol as a man-hater by quoting back a line she'd once written proposing the banishment of the male sex. At one point, I think you propose we should dispose of all men, he asked. Into Montana, she replied. Into Montana? Yes, and ret retrain them. At this point, the judge interrupted, putting Tecopina out of his misery by explaining that Carol's writing had been satirical. She was directly referencing Jonathan Smith Swift's A Modest Proposal, the famously tongue-in-cheek essay suggesting that the solution to Ireland's economic problems was to eat children. And as an aside, this is a good lesson in the usefulness of studying, or at least reading literature, to be able to put together a successful legal argument. So I'll return to the quotation, Tecopina's overarching strategy seemed to involve persuading a jury that there are things Carol said and did that a real assault victim simply wouldn't say or do. It relies on playing Carol against a trope that defense attorneys in sexual assault cases have leaned on for decades. Real rape victims act appropriately victimized. They do not laugh, watch po popular television shows starring their alleged rapists, or try to sell books. Real rape victims scream, call the police, and have lives defined by trauma. She is really minimizing true rape victims, real rape victims, Tecopina said in his opening arguments. She is exploiting their pain and their suffering. As Hesse wrote, what Carol was actually exploiting was Tacopina's faulty assumptions about the meaning of victimhood. What she was really doing was rejecting the premise of his line of questioning. Pain and suffering might manifest in tears and panic attacks, and by the way, Carol described having some of those too, or they might manifest in hysterical laughter, the kind that erupts when your brain hasn't quite caught up to what's happening to your body. They might manifest in refusing to ever set foot in Bergdorf Goodman again, or they might manifest, as Carol testified, in accompanying your niece when she shopped for wedding gowns there, enjoying a glass of champagne and trying to live in the moment. On the witness stand, 
Carol allowed herself to step outside of the mold of how we historically have imagined victims of the kind of assault Carol is alleging. It is not her job to be the kind of victim that Tecopina might have assumed she should be. It is not her job to play the kind of victim the jury might be used to seeing. It was her job to be the person she is, someone who is defiant, ambitious, funny, and optimistic, even if she was there to tell a story of pain and suffering. She brought her whole self to the trial and dared anyone to hold it against her. So, what of the Middle Ages? In early January of 1472, in Dijon, Burgundy, a migrant from the Lorraine named Jean made an accusation of sexual assault against a group of mercenaries and their local accomplices. That she dared to accuse them is surprising. We know all too well how difficult it is for survivors of sexual assault to come forward, and Jeanne was not exactly the perfect victim. Estranged from her husband, she had made her way to Burgundy and to its capital city of Dijon to find a way to make a living, to earn her bread, as she put it. And the path she chose was not exactly the most respectable, especially for a married woman, because she became a priest's mistress. Given her marginal status, she seems an unlikely or even foolish litigant. Jeanne demanded justice nonetheless, and this demand met with an even more surprising response. We typically expect medieval European authorities to have had little interest in protecting the rights of women like Jeanne, or that they would even recognize women in Jeanne's situation as having any rights. But in fact, the municipal authorities in Dijon vigorously pursued Jeanne's accusation. To be sure, there were exacerbating situ uh, circumstances that motivated these judicial officers beyond any sympathy for Jeanne as victim. They had been struggling for decades to restrain the violence and gang rapes that took place with horrific regularity in the city. In addition, Jeanne was pregnant at the time of the assault, compounding the crimes of abduction and assault with endangering her fetus. That Jeanne's infant daughter, born two days after the attack, had been conceived in adulterous sex with a priest, does not seem to have mollified the municipal authorities' fervor to punish the attackers. They did not view her adultery with a priest or her perjury about that priest as grounds to dismiss their case, continuing despite learning that she had initially lied to them to conceal her adultery. They tolerated that perjury. They also accepted some variation in her account of the assault. Well aware, then, that Jeanne was no perfect victim, the municipal authorities continued to prosecute her case and to seek the death penalty against her assailants. In short, the very thing that modern audiences so often assume should have mattered in determining a woman's ability to seek legal recourse in the Middle Ages did not actually matter in this case. The past, to echo David Bell again, is sometimes very strange. The strangeness surprises us because of what we know about rape handling now, but also because modern scholarship on medieval Europe often presupposes that a woman of disreputable status, especially if she were suspect suspected of sexual impropriety, would face an array of legal disadvantages. Certainly, it is assumed such women would not be able to succeed in making a rape accusation. Yet recent scholarship, including my own, suggests that this presumption is overdue for revision. Historian Leah Otis Kaur, for example, has found that sex workers of the brothels of medieval southern France were able to make rape accusations and could demand compensation and other damages. Similarly, historian Carol Lansing has shown that lower-status women in Bologna, even those rep reputed to be having sex outside marriage, could make rape accusations with some success. My own work in northern France, meanwhile, has demonstrated that judicial authorities there had far greater interest in prosecuting and punishing men for extramarital sex than they did women, and that women's sex outside marriage only rarely resulted in serious criminal punishment. Modern scholars have too often allowed what they know of modern, especially 18th and 19th century, handlings of rape and adultery to color their interpretations of medieval practices that we usually have at best a fragmentary picture of. Certainly women, like men, were sometimes punished for extramarital sex, but this happened on a sliding scale of seriousness, one that rated women closer to the bottom than the top in the hierarchy of greatest concern. 
the greater problem confronted by authorities who set about mandating how people should behave and what punishments might be for misbehavior lay not in what women did, but what was done by men. This included the deeds of men at the top of society, the lords and priests and positions of power in a community, not to mention the masters of a household whose sexual desires might extend not just to the servants, but to sisters or daughters. In short, medieval Christian society saw itself as plagued by male lust, by men's desire for sex with women, and by their competition over and exploitation of women. This was a far greater problem than female lust or temptresses or seductresses using their sexual appeal to manipulate men. Sexual violence, assault, coerced sex, all were all too common in this society. There is a great deal more to say about rape culture in the Middle Ages, but for now I will say only that this was a society that had to contend with and tolerated a lot of coerced sex. Medieval authorities did not by any stretch of the imagination make it easy for women to bring forward accusations of rape or defloration or impregnation. That said, they did in fact prosecute at least some of these cases. They prosecuted at least sometimes, but they did not do so in a manner that would disrupt the patriarchal order. Women could not count on courts to uphold the laws designed to limit male sexual aggression. For women who accused men of rape, sexual assault, defloration, seduction, or impregnation did not get anywhere near the help that the courts theoretically offered them. Women were all too often, instead, subjected to extrajudicial violence and abuse and had to find ways of coping without the help of the courts. In circumstances hardly unique to the Middle Ages, most survivors likely suffered in silence and indeed could not have hoped for a great way, a great deal by way of legal remedy. But even so, women and their families did have some re recourse. Some did make accusations, and some had cases resolved in their favor, resulting in criminal punishment or with compensation demanded from the perpetrator or both. Moreover, to repeat, to succeed with this litigation, women did not have to be of spotless reputation. One example of rape prosecution from the 14th century Paris helps us to see what I think are two central issues for understanding the nature and problems of medieval rape trials. As it demonstrates, judicial authorities would, in some cases at least, overlook a woman's spotty sexual history, but also that at the same time they did not make it easy. In the late 14th century, and an act of remarkable bravery, Perrette de saint accused a group of men of breaking into her home on the Rue Montmartre with swords drawn, dragging her through the streets to the fields outside the city where they violently raped her. Um, she was detained in prison during the investigation and obliged to repeat her allegations in court and in a confrontation with the accused. She did all of this, admitting, as was also reported against her by those she accused, that she had previously been involved with one of the men who had assaulted her, that she had been for a long time, as she said, a fille de vie, a working girl, or loose living young woman, but that she had renounced that life and was now engaged to be married. Her past, and even her past relations with one of the accused, did not deter the royal officials in their proceedings. As I have argued in a recent article, the medieval misogyny and patriarchal structures that we have to confront lie instead in the gang rape itself, a horrific expression of masculine aggression, and in what the court required of the woman as accuser. We can learn even more about the problematic handling of sexual assault in the Middle Ages and where justice really fell short by returning to my main example, Jean from Lorraine. Unlike E. Jean Carroll, there is no sign of a problem believing her or no. It does not even seem to matter that, again, most unlike E. Jean, Jean did not seem to have had a good deal of legal advice. She perjured herself at least once and got caught doing so and did not manage to maintain with great consistency what she said had happened to her, changing her testimony as to the extent of the injuries she had suffered and how and where precisely she was assaulted and which of the men did what. Even so, there was no dismissal of the case once the authorities found out that she was a priest's mistress and adulteress. There was no dismissal of the case because she changed her story. Instead, her persistence in maintaining her accusation throughout is enough. 
and the authorities continued in their efforts to seek confession and conviction, even resorting to torturing one of the accused. There was only small cuff- comfort, though, in that they were willing or even eager to prosecute her claim, and in such a horrific way. They did not care that she did not want them to seek the death penalty, and they could not guarantee her safety when she was threatened with vengeance. The men she accused were eventually transferred to another jurisdiction for continued prosecution, and there we lose sight of them, though one was back in prison in Dijon a few months later. Meanwhile, as for Jeanne, she had first of all, she had had first of all to go into hiding and then take up work in a place of sanctuary, a hospital, to attempt to protect herself from reprisals. It is not clear that she got any of the compensation she sought. Did she at least get justice? I I like to think that at least being treated as someone who had the right to make a complaint and who was not the kind of person you could assault with impunity may have mattered to her and mattered so much that she was willing to take the risks that she took. More broadly, what I want to stress today is that in the Middle Ages, you did not have to be a perfect victim, a virgin, to make a rape accusation. You did, though, have to be very brave and willing to go through the horrifying ordeal of a trial and risk the vengeance of the friends and family of the accused, and you could not count on the protection of the courts. There is something else that is often misunderstood because of the strangeness of the past, and in particular, because of the care we must take to try to understand the meaning and function of medieval laws. The medieval legal stipulations found in numerous collections of laws, that rape survivors scream, that they appear with torn clothing, all with biblical antecedents, is often taken by modern scholars as a requirement for proof of rape, but it was not. It certainly made rape easier to prove, but there were plenty of convictions even without it. Moreover, the problem of proof was far from unique to rape. The recommendations to scream, to raise what is called a hue and cry, and to have evidence of violence or loss appear also in the guidelines for how to prosecute theft. This was a weak rather than strong legal system, or rather systems. Its harsh language and its intermittently harsh punishments are expressions of weakness rather than strength. Medieval legal authorities were not in control of their society. The judicial systems could offer only rather poor justice at best. Here I offer just one example of the essential need to consider context when writing about the past. When modern scholars deplore that medieval rape victims most often had to seek whatever recourse they could find out of court, they miss that this was true for most crimes. When modern scholars deplore a low conviction rate for rape, they missed that this was also true for most criminal prosecutions. Medieval courts across Europe were very slow to convict, and especially slow to uphold the death penalty, which I have a hard time regretting, uh, aside. But most cases were settled or not out of court. In free judicial proceedings, they are called with compensation or not. And those did resolve a conviction, those that did resolve a conviction were often pardoned. To return to rape, another of its surprising features for us that is often missed about the handling of rape in the Middle Ages is that charging rape was not anywhere near as socially disastrous for the survivors as is usually assumed. Prosecuting was dangerous because of vengeance more than anything else. A medieval woman's reputation was far more durable than we often suppose, and if damaged by rumors of sex, forced or otherwise, reparable, reconstructable. That men had sex with women, whether the women wanted them to or no, was all too believable. Women were not blamed for it, but they did have to suffer it and find their own ways of coping. In essence, the horror of rape in the Middle Ages was in its pervasiveness and in the limited ability of authorities to do much about it. To conclude, thinking about E. Jean Carroll while researching, oh, never mind, while researching Jean from Lorraine, helped me to recognize in them two wonderfully imperfect victims with some surprising commonalities. I'll just give you, it's speaking to me, commonalities. Uh, Both women were exceptionally brave, both beautiful, and with a shared love of beauty and clothes. Both, finally, are funny. They both make jokes, even during their testimony. As for why they both became complainants, 
E. Jean says she uh, made her complaint because she wanted her name back and to join the movement of resisting centuries of sexual abuse and harassment. In doing so, she and her lawyers successfully challenged the perfect victim paradigm. E. Jean, if anything, leaned into her role as imperfect victim. She owned her imperfections as victim, survivor, and as female, who in traditional narratives might have been cast as asking for it. And she won. Eugene has not gotten her money yet and may not, but she has won every case so far, and I hope there's joy in that for her. And Jean from Lorraine, I think she litigated because she wanted to be identified in a court of law as the kind of woman you could not do these kinds of things to without penalty. I don't think I would have figured that out unless I had made this comparison. Jeanne was not on some mission to make the world better for womankind. Her goal was to save herself. I don't think we should condemn her for that. Certainly even the authorities judging the case she had instigated did not seem to think so. She did it, I think, to test her neighbors and their willingness to vouch for her and to demand of the authorities that they help her to proclaim that she was not the kind of woman you could abduct and assault with impunity. It was for that reason she demanded justice, as well as seeking some compensation. Is there a way to see her as winning this? Given what she was up against, I do think so. As David Bell concluded his two chairs for presentism, I quote, There's nothing more potentially liberatory than the sense of endless possibility that great history can open up. The sense that categories of thought and practice are not fixed, that the world can be made to change in all sorts of strange and unexpected ways. We may be driven inescapably by present day concerns, but if we make the past look too much like the present, how can we envision a future that looks different from where we are now? End of quotation. I hope that the, old, the story I am trying to tell of a past and its strangeness can be seen as a small contribution in that direction. Jean von Lorraine, this imperfect victim, has a story of survival that I am trying to find the right way to tell now, and I hope it is one that will inspire others to find what they need to survive in dangerous and troubling times. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, it is our Manhattan College tradition to begin with a student question. Uh, so I will look to the students first and then to other members of the audience for questions and comments. Students, we will be patient. We'll get, we'll get there for wait. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm headed to the far back there. Um, my question is, how did you find this woman from the Middle Ages and like what made you pick her over someone else? Thank you so much for that question. Uh, so I um, I was planning on writing a big book about the consequences of extramarital sex and pregnancy for women. And I was looking for women who were pregnant outside marriage everywhere I could find them. Um, it's actually sort of how uh, almost everything I've written up to now happened. Uh, I was trying to find women and I kept finding men instead. And so I had to write about the men first because they were there. Um, but while I was doing that, I was able to see women here and there and start to collect enough where I thought I could actually tell a story about what happened when a nun got pregnant, what happened when a married woman got pregnant, when her husband was somewhere else, what happened, you know, all of these different circumstances, what happened when a, when a servant got pregnant, what happened when a prostitute got pregnant. Um, and so I had all of that and I was all set to try to write that. And then I was sort of bumbling through the archives um, and I came across a, a reference to a case in Dijon and it said something about this pre, and then there was an article about it that said that a priest's mistress had uh, made a rape accusation and that she had lost the case once they found out that 
she was a priest's mistress. And so I thought, well, that's interesting because that's not the kind of thing I've been seeing. So I better get the case. So I, I went, I was working in France anyway. And so I went to Dijon and I photographed the case in the archives. And I found out that it was the opposite of what the woman had said. Um, that in fact, they were continuing to pursue the case long after they knew she was a priest's mistress. Um, and so once I saw this case, which was over 70 pages long and has all of this testimony from the woman herself, from all of her neighbors, uh, I, I realized that what I needed to do was tell her story and use her story to, to speak about all of these other women, too. So it was a, a combination of accident and um, luck, I guess. So first of all, I just wanted to say that David Bell gave one of these uh, lectures as well. So I'm sure that he will be very glad to hear that he was evoked. Um, and this was a great uh, lecture and I, we thank you so much for it. But I wanna go into the, into the, what this means for legal prosecution, you know, I understand that what you were trying to do was to tell these women's stories and how important these women's stories are. But in my experience, French judges don't really care about the accuser. They care about the accused and that they were going after the accused, no matter who the accuser was. And I, I wonder whether one of the variables you might consider is who is being accused and is there some correlation with the success when you have it of the case? Um, Cause I, I do think that that might enrich our understanding of what this means in terms of, of the law. Yeah, I know, absolutely. It's uh, so important to look at everybody involved. Um, and the, so in the cases from medieval France that I'm familiar with, um, status absolutely mattered for everybody involved. Um, mostly high status people don't go anywhere near this court and mostly high status people are not being prosecuted by this court. Uh, that said, there are um, some exceptions among the accused, actually. They, they do, um, when their jurisdiction permits, they do go after some fairly prominent and important people. Um, and so, it, it, or they try, and then someone more powerful than them takes the case away. And so that's the end of that. Um, and as for but but I will say, at least from the Middle Ages, there, there is a, a fair amount of real interest in collecting the stories of the accuser as well as the accused um, and, and making sure that their testimony uh, is, is collected and written down and getting the witness testimony. But, but you're absolutely right. You have to look at the accused as well to see what it is that the courts wanted to do. Um, and, and certainly what often seems to be happening with the cases from Dijon that I'm looking at uh, and from Bologna also that uh, my colleague Carol Lansing was looking at is that there seems to have been a real effort to try to get out of the communities some of these really dangerous men. And to the extent that it was possible to do that, these prosecutions were sometimes used to that end because... Um, People who didn't want to be detained in prison and investigated and perhaps even tortured, uh, if they knew there, that was a risk, they often fled. Um, and then they would be uh, eventually banned from the city. So it had the effect that was sought, even if there wasn't necessarily a judgment. Um, so that's certainly the kind of thing that you can see. Thank you for that um, in, insightful, interesting presentation. It really, really makes history shine. Um, when you talked about past and present and Me Too and um, in relation to medieval history and the medieval history is in France, that got me thinking of 
the reactions of people in France, the Me Too movement, um, in prominent people and so forth. And, I, I, you know, I only know what I read in the papers, just just a little glimmers that there was evidently a kind of complicated re- re- reaction in France. And I wondered about, um, if that's the case, um, about um, French historians, medieval historians, and what might be some of the interactions and so forth. That is a very interesting point. Yeah. So there has been a different reception of Me Too in the in the France. And there is also a different reception to um, thinking about gender in France. They, uh, my French colleagues like to say that when it comes to gender, they're running about 10 years behind us. Um, and they're not necessarily in a hurry to catch up at all. Um, and so... Uh, there, there is uh, less eagerness to talk about this stuff um, uh, among a lot of French scholars. Yeah, and so it's it's interesting always to go there and to um, present on it because you can get a very mixed response. Some people um, are much more interested than others. I mean, I have some wonderful colleagues who I mean, I'm I'm co-organizing a special issue of a journal called Medieval People on women and gender and family in the Middle Ages, and a bunch of the co- contributors are French, and so it's not not a rule. But on the whole, there is more of a conservatism and a, a reluctance to think it's necessary to talk about these issues. Um, and then there's a very strong organization of uh, women scholars in France that is trying to push back um, that I'm, I'm a member of, so... <laughs> There's a student, I think. So you mentioned at one point that the victim from Paris, she said that she didn't want them to go for the death penalty, but then they decided to anyway. Was this sort of penalty really common back then, or would that deter a lot of victims from coming forward because they didn't want their um, offender to be prosecuted so harshly? Yeah, so uh, the death penalty was very commonly uh, a risk and rarely one that you arrived at. So there were a lot of serious crimes like theft. Um, You could easily be uh, in principle executed for theft as well as a whole bunch of other things. Um, It was, however, extremely rare. And so the, the question is how good a person could have been at at doing, uh, you know, medieval level statistics to try to understand, like, how likely is it that, and so, um, I'm sorry, I'm joking about it, but I find some of this stuff, I guess, like like Lakey Jean Carroll, and I have to joke to to deal with these things because they're so difficult. I mean, I I can't imagine if I were in the situation, if I had to make an accusation against someone and know that I was risking that person being executed, no matter what they did to me. That's just my, you know, my position. So um, it certainly may have deterred a lot of people from coming forward with an accusation. Uh, and and it especially was upsetting for the woman uh, I'm writing about from uh, from the Lorraine because she said over and over from her first uh, complaint. She said, I do not want their death on my conscience. I do not want their death on my conscience. I'm telling you what they did to me because they did it to me and they endangered, you know, me and my fetus. But I, you know, I do not want their death on my conscience. I just want justice. And they didn't care, um, which gives you some perspective on <laughs> their priorities. Like she was not their priority. Uh, and, and so that is, is really troubling, uh, of course. Um, and certainly that would have been why uh, a lot of things in the Middle Ages, because the penalties could be so high, even if it was unlikely, uh, even if it was most likely that you weren't going to be executed, um, the possibility that somebody might be executed was definitely part of why for most things, most things were settled out of court. Um, That end, there was no strong police system in place to make sure that there wasn't going to be vengeance. You know, they didn't have anything like a witness protection program. Um, The woman I'm writing about had to go into sanctuary 
to try to protect herself from the people who she accused. Um, that's she's not the only one, you know. I, so so I mean, all of these things made judicial systems so difficult, which is something we could think about today when we have very harsh penalties for things. Sorry, I'm being being political instead of historical. Excuse me. Pretend I didn't say that. You're in my pants. Good evening. Has there been a modern day E.J. Carroll in France? And if so, what was the outcome? There certainly have been some uh, Me Too's in France. Um, I don't know if we have outcomes yet. There, there were there were definitely some very prominent. Um, I think it was a, a well, um, Dominique Strauss-Kahn and uh, quite a few other people. Yeah, there have been some. Some some have been successful. Some I think are not yet resolved. Um, some some men of the Harvey Weinstein variety, if there was enough evidence, I think were at least removed from the positions of power. Um, but I'm not. What's that? I wouldn't say that. No, no, no. There there are certainly some. Um, So I'm going to I don't ask, have power. <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm going to ask the large and socio-political question. So I'm going to give you a chance to be political because I really want an answer to this if I can get one. Um, looking back now with your historical lens and being able to compare these two, I mean, we I think we can potentially argue that what happened with E. Jean Carroll was unusual and the outcome was, I think, applauded, but not necessarily common. Given that and the great amount of difference between what happened in medieval France to what has happened now. This may be an unanswerable question, but in your view, what do you think has created such a culture that we no longer believe the victim and we protect the accusers to a point where, yes, women do not come forward, despite how brave they are, that there is an expectation of being the perfect victim. There, we have we know so much more about trauma. We know so much more about what happens to victims after this. Um, that there is no such thing as a perfect victim. I, I realize I'm spanning a very large portion of time, but there obviously was a shift, as you mentioned, somewhere in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, I mean, given that our basic court system is based on <laughs> France. I kind of am curious as to like, where did we massively go wrong culturally and how do we somehow fix this? Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, these are, these are really important questions that I definitely wrestle with. Um, and uh, how we got here is, is hard to say. I mean, some of it, I think, is that a lot of so so in the Middle Ages, for example, the, there are a lot of laws that are terrifyingly strict that they never had any intention of carrying out, or that they were meant to be sort of performative. Like this is this is just to tell you that this is bad and you should stop. But we know we have no power to actually do it, so we're not going to worry about it. So starting in the 16th century, people start to take these things more seriously and start to apply them more seriously. And that becomes increasingly more true, um, but without without some of the changes specifically for women that have come later, starting more in the 17th, 18th, especially 19th century and now now. And so, I mean, one thing I've been wrestling with is I think... It is a, a sort of a curse of modernity and the idea that women should be treated as equal, that this is how women are being punished for being equal, um, that, uh, that, that in the past, you know, those horrible things were going to happen to you because you were disadvantaged and you were disadvantaged. And so you would just have to sort of manage it on your own terms. Um, but because women were considered to be lesser humans, um, perfection was not likely. 
Now there is this idea of perfection as well as equality and, and with all the good and bad that comes with that. And I, I sort of see that as a complicated legacy. How to fix it is beyond me. I mean, I don't know if anybody noticed in the New York Times and a couple of other places, um, there's just a, a there's a new defamation case. To talk about E. Jean Carroll being an exception, there's a new defamation case coming out of Yale University where there was a, a male student who was um, accused and there was a sort of a combination prosecution at Yale using the usual university procedures that have been uh, worked up in the last bunch of years. And then there was an external um, proceeding with, you know, police involved in all of that. So the the external one, uh, the accuser lost. The Yale case, the, um, the student was eventually sent away. And now he's got, uh, he's suing Yale and he's suing his accuser for defamation, and uh, and and so there is. Uh, we're we're definitely in a in a complicated place right now, and I don't know what we need to do to try to make it possible, make it more possible, for people who have been the victims of uh, of assault to try to find some justice without you know the the all of the consequences for everybody involved i mean i i sometimes wonder if if it were possible that the i i don't know i i, I shouldn't uh, i what i what i always say is is a cop out but it's true um living in the present basically helps me understand the past better but i'm not getting any better with the present um I'm not, I'm not getting there, but I will, I will try. Okay. I think I saw two more hands. Yes. So let me, I'll go to Fred and then here. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I must acknowledge I gained many insights, yeah. but they reinforce a sense that I've long had that the right the male right of sex with whom he wishes has been so ingrained and deepened in our traditions and in the law, and therefore in the law. I taught medieval history, and we would come to the right of the lord of the manor to deprive the new husband, the newly married, uh, the new husband of his bride for that the first night of their of their marriage when i brought that out in class the students would laugh hmm. it was uh, you know it was a, it was a great joke i don't think that would happen now or at least i would uh thump them for it um, <laughs> maybe you wouldn't <laughs> i wouldn't I, recommend doing that now <laughs> I, I gather that that lasted uh it certainly was custom and probably law and lasted to the french revolution was never abolished it simply disappeared with the disappearance of feudalism. So I can offer uh, some comfort. You've given me some comfort, right? So, so we can take some comfort in that at least students now wouldn't laugh. And I think the, the hope always for me remains with, with the students. Um, I don't mean to pass the buck, but I'm really hoping that you, you students who are so good at this stuff will get us out of this mess somehow. Um, and I'm very eager to help if I can, but I, I, I defer to you. Um, the other comfort I can offer from a historical perspective is at least that that um, that that first night is is not that was not allowed. I mean, men, lords could certainly uh, rape women if they wanted to and probably get away with it. But there was no such uh, privilege. So there is that small comfort, at least. That that was one of the horror stories they liked to tell about the Middle Ages uh, to distract us from the really awful things that people were doing in the Middle Ages instead. They did, yeah, no doubt. Mm -mm. It's just Braveheart. Well, so so Sir Walter Scott loves to use the Middle Ages to do all kinds of things. Um, and uh, he, yeah, no, it's it's a it's an invention. Um, 
but it's an invention that reflects a real problem. Uh, I mean, the the this guy, since that was another question. Yeah, so that was just to help you visit Burgundy, and I should have said that that was what I was doing. I just wanted to take you to Burgundy with me. So his the, the man who's there, um, his father had at least 20, probably 30 illegitimate children. Um, so that was absolutely going on. And all of, you know, all of those children had mothers. And uh, while he very proudly had chroniclers procla proclaim that he never took a woman by force, that was something the, the King of France might have done, but not him, not the Duke of Burgundy. Um, it's hard to know how good to feel about that or how much trust to have in that claim. <laughs> Well, he only had two. Not so bold. Salutations. Um, I want to thank you first and foremost for your time and dedication. It was a really informative topic. Um, and that brings me to my question. Um, when studying history, oftentimes the quintessential question is, um, you know, when we look at um, the schematics of history, we oftentimes think about, well, um, is it um, progressing constantly, um, or is it stagnant? Do we go back in time? And how does progress really work? And I know it's a complicated question, but, um, you know, as you were mentioning uh, towards the end that both of these women had a lot of commonalities, um, as well as differences, of course, but um, in your perspective, how would you say that corresponds to the progress of history as a whole? on uh, victimiz victimization of um, trials of rape and such? Uh, so, so certainly things have gotten better in a lot of ways, at least in sort of Western countries. Uh, I mean, so, so Dijon, for example, in the 15th century had a, an appalling number of gang rapes. Um, and we we don't know how many, but I, I've you know, basically I've been working through these registers, and I've seen at least one or two a year. Um, I am very happy to say that that is no longer true in in France now. Um, it's certainly still true that sexual assault is a big problem in France as it is here, um, but the the legal system has gotten better. So I guess we can see progress. It's just not good enough. Um, there's still, you know, I, I mean, so we we now do not have to go through um, confrontations with the accused while they're being tortured. Uh, so that's better. But we do have to, to sit there and have a defense attorney say horrible things to us, you know, and, and bring in our own past and, and so on. So... I, I guess, I mean, I, I tend to not see history as progress necessarily, um, but I guess on the whole, there's progress. Um, and so there's hope also. Okay, well, thanks thanks so much for coming and presenting and thanks everyone for coming today and for your, for your questions and discussion. So thanks very much. Thank you.